Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Developing a Healthcare Workforce to Outperform in the Skills Economy, sponsored by Cornerstone. My name is Andrew Greisman, WBR Insights Senior Analyst for HR Healthcare, and I'll be moderating this presentation. Before we dive in, I'd like to bring your attention to the console in front of you. The windows or widgets laid out on the screen are customizable, meaning you can move these around to maximize, minimize, or reposition them to fit whatever device you're using to connect with us. Please refer to the Resource Center to download the newly published benchmark report that our presentation is based off of, as well as our event agenda and a discount code for attending this webinar. We're going to try and save 15 minutes or so at the end of today's discussion for a Q&A session. So, at any point during the conversation, feel free to submit questions using that portal. So without further ado, let's get introduced to our panelists. We have with us today Kathy Martin, Vice President for Workforce Policy at the California Hospital Association. You just say hi, Kathy, so everyone hears you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, thank you for attending. We have Jason Hopkins, who's the Director of Talent Acquisition and Internal Marketing at Emeris Holdings. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. We also have Sean Ray, who's the Director of Nursing Talent Acquisition at BJC Healthcare. Hi, everyone. Welcome. And Dr. Tom Tonkin, who's the Principal for Thought Leadership and Advisory Services at Cornerstone On Demand. Good morning, and very excited to be here with this wonderful set of panelists. And again, I'm Andrew Greisman. I am the WBR Insights Senior Analyst for HR Healthcare and serving as the moderator. So let's move on. Before we get started going through some of the data during this presentation, I'd like to just introduce the research that we've done with Cornerstone. Uh, we went out to our conference database and surveyed 118 executives in HR healthcare. Uh, we've all uncovered some very interesting findings on the state of the industry, as well as some takeaways for how to react to them. So just a reminder that that content's available for you all to download in the Content Center. So let's set the scene. Uh, we reached out to the members of our community to learn about the challenges facing human capital managers in healthcare today. And we've identified three trends that we'll be looking at during the course of this webinar. One is the emergence of the skills economy and the influence of trends from the private sector on HR for the healthcare environment. Regulatory forces, which are defining the direction and needs of the organization and need to be reacted to. And lastly, the role of technology, which is becoming more adept at facilitating talent management and skill sharing. So I'd like to ask our panelists, what trends have you experienced that are making an impact on your missions? And I'd like to start by inviting Jason to speak on this first. Thank you, Andrew. Um, going first on this one is almost like a loaded question. Uh, working in healthcare um, is just a state of uncertainty. And so there's uh, some constant things that are impacting the mission, but uh, being a guy that eats and sleeps and breathes talent, um, that, that's the, the focus that I have every day. There's just so much competition in the healthcare space today, especially in nursing, uh, with labor shortages. Uh, we're losing the baby boomers, uh, yet at the same time, we, the graduation rates uh, for nurses are not there to backfill them, um, as well as for the growth. Uh, whether that's a lack of interest or even a recent article on CNN Money uh, discussing the fact that over 56,000 nurses were uh, qualified, uh, potential nurses were turned away from schools because there aren't enough uh, teachers and educators. Um, so knowing where we're going, um, where there's going to be a shortage of nearly 2 million um, nursing roles here in the next couple of years, depending on what study you're reading, uh, that's the trend that's going to impact uh, our business and every business in healthcare the most. Um, Sean, did you have some additional thoughts? Uh, yeah, so um, I would say I would definitely echo um, what Jason said because, uh, you know, I'm over a uh, you know, nursing recruitment for our system, and absolutely it is a challenge hiring, especially hiring um, experienced nurses, but um, hiring new grad nurses into our environment that is, has, is experiencing constant change with our the regulations and um, challenges with reimbursement. Um, you know, we, we, we're facing, um, you know, with the value-based purchasing and 
bundled, bundled payments, the frontline staff has to be acutely aware of um, their impact on patient satisfaction and um, uh, with H caps and uh, ensuring that we get our reimbursed um, to our expectations too. And um, it is, um, you know, getting that. Um, I guess that upskilling to that frontline staff is of utmost importance. Coming out of school, they have to learn their environment, again, which is constantly changing, but again, uh, additional skills that are needed in order to um, you know, ensure that everything is documented as expected, and then um, ensuring that with their uh, delivering consumer friendly uh, patient care um, so they are they are facing a lot at the bedside currently and I would also add to that that um, you know we have uh, challenges with um, how we're delivering care um, and that, that impact on our um, workforce uh, virtual care for example um, and then also the changing candidate um, you know uh, with uh, Jason mentioned the ba baby boomers going out but we've got the Millennials coming in they've been coming in and they've got their goal set of um, okay I'm in two years I'm going to be in advanced practice nurse school and after that you know so they've, they've got their their goals planned and if they don't if we can't meet their goals, they're going somewhere else who, some, to another organization who's going to meet their goals. So uh, very challenging from multiple directions. Um, yeah, so um, Kathy, do you have anything to add? Sure. Thanks, Thanks Sean. Um, yeah, you know, one mm -hmm. thing I'd like to touch on, something that we're seeing increasingly here in California as an emerging trend, especially in the past um, couple of years, is the attention given to the income gap and social justice and equality issues here in the state. And what we're seeing and how this is impacting our mission, or maybe more importantly, how we communicate as an industry our mission, is that um, certain organizations, and, and many of them you know, backed by labor, are introducing uh, bills in the legislature that are targeting the healthcare sector as a promise in terms of good jobs, well-paying jobs, and upward mobility for many populations, which is absolutely true, but at the same time, putting very prescriptive um, requirements in statute for how we, as an industry, train the future health workforce and how we partner with certain educational institutions. So it's a, it's a very interesting trend to watch. Um, we expect a couple of bills to perhaps make it to the governor in this session. Um, most of them we're okay with. But how, it is, how it's impacting us in, as an industry is we have to step back and look at, you know, how are we training? Are we training the most diverse workforce that we can to treat um, the patients of the future? Are we doing the best we can to partner with a diversity of education partners, whether those are public or private or uh, universities or community colleges? How do we best do that? What we're finding is we actually are uh, doing a great job as an industry, and I think um, where this trend will lead us is to be better communicators of the work that hospitals are doing in this area so that we can be sure that any legislation or mandates that come down the pike um, are actually in line with, with where we're going as an industry and not instead punitive um, in nature. So that's something we're watching very closely. Um, Dr. Tonkin, I'm sure you have something to add yourself. I, I do, and, and I appreciate the, all the insight that Jason, uh, Sean, and Kathy have provided. I mean, obviously, these three are on here because they are highly sought-after practitioners and see these on the trends perspective. I'm um, hopefully that I can add a little bit of color that uh, highlights healthcare within the overall society and in the, in the industries. I think uh, an aspect that uh, that Jason mentioned earlier was this idea of teaching versus nursing. I think one of the challenges I think we'll always have, and, and we have similar challenges in other sectors such as engineering. Uh, we just don't see that because there isn't so so much effort or, or uh, not effort, but the gap of people versus the demand. But the idea here is if a, if a nurse wants to nurse, they don't want to teach, they want to nurse. And so there you have a gap. Same thing with engineers, right? Engineers don't want to teach, they want to engineer. Uh, so, so I think that's something that we have to potentially, at a talent management level, look at and see if we can change the way uh, we motivate folks to to get into that space. The second point I want to make, and again, I'm going to go cross industry here and, and, and look at the society as a whole, is 
is the jobs that we're looking for in healthcare are they something different than they used to be and are those expectations changed from when they used to be again i'm going to go outside of healthcare for a second and draw an example that i think uh, healthcare is headed to is with manufacturing. I don't know if everybody recalls some time ago uh, a TV ad by GE where a young man uh, coming out of college uh, uh, has a, a job uh, in a manufacturing company, GE that is, and everyone thinks he's you know going to use a sledgehammer or build something. And there's this perspective, and he says, "No, I'm a I'm a programmer. I'm gonna I'm gonna do integration between these machines and and something that's very." Uh, very odd or, or counterintuitive for, say, a manufacturing organization, right? There's this perception of this. Might there be something like like this in healthcare uh, in the future? Is are there perceptions of what people believe the jobs in healthcare are, and therefore maybe either moving away or or have a different perspective? So I I, I like to develop all of this as we move forward. But but Andrew, I think we could go on to the next a uh, next slide here. Thanks, Tom. So now we're starting to get into some of the data that we've actually gone out and gathered. So you see here uh, something that's featured in our report, but we pulled it out to discuss today. 70% of respondents to our survey agreed that regulation dictated their operations to a degree. So what are some of the ways that regulation has impacted our panelists' efforts? Um, and then conversely, uh, since this is an area where you can share a unique perspective, Kathy, maybe you can start us off by answering, you know, what have you observed in your experience as the impact of regulation on the industry, and what do you feel the future should potentially hold for an improved regulatory environment? Great. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, living here and breathing in California, one of the most regulated states um, in the nation, we certainly see this very acutely in our industry. Um, you know, everybody understands and appreciates that regulations and, and statutes are, are necessary to protect consumers and patients and, and to regulate our business and our day-to-day -day operations. However, here in California, we have two sort of um, uh, barriers when it comes to the regulatory environment. The first being that we tend to have the most stringent regulatory environment when it comes to health workforce in many areas, um, other areas as well, but in health workforce, we tend to have the most strict uh, scope of practice laws. We have our ban on the corporate practice of medicine, which, meaning, which means uh, hospitals cannot hire physicians. So we have these extra burdens, if you will, in the regulatory environment that maybe other states in the nation don't have and that don't align with federal policy as well. Then to layer on top of that, we have a tremendously antiquated regulatory framework when it comes to health care. Um, and so many of our regulations are decades and decades old, have not been updated to reflect health care delivery in the 21st century. Um, and a uh, administration that's slow to respond and, and to modernize those regulatory uh, requirements and statutory um, uh, laws on the book. So in terms of a solution, we are working very closely with the state to begin to modernize some of those regulations that are extremely outdated. Um, some of them are what we like to refer to as workforce modernization uh, bills or, or regulations, things that have been on the books for years that require certain uh, clinical folks in our workforce to have requirements that are completely outdated that no other state in the nation requires, and getting those off the books so that we can begin to attract talent to our state, especially in our most high demand occupations. And then hopefully work with the state as they begin to update their, their regulations to create a regulatory environment that is a little more flexible and nimble with the times, given the fact that healthcare is changing so rapidly. When you put something on the books in, in a regulatory environment and a, an industry like healthcare has to adhere to that standard over decades, um, there, as you can imagine, are going to be many, many changes in the industry. And the fact that the administration responds so slowly, those regs have to be nimble and flexible to meet healthcare where it will be um, in the coming decades. So we're hoping that we're going to make some progress and, and um, look back to California and see how we do. Um, Sean, I'm sure you have something to add to that as well. 
Yeah, and I very, very, it was a very interesting perspective you provided, Kathy. Thank you. Um, I'm lo- uh, BGC Healthcare is located in the mid- Midwest and um, in uh, eastern, eastern and mid Missouri, and then um, uh, southwestern Illinois. So we have two states that we are encompassing, and um, we find that working with Missouri um, is much. Um, I get and if you can believe it, they're much more progressive. Which can, you know, the Midwest is pretty conservative, but they are very, uh, much more progressive than Illinois as far as um, regulations. That, um, for example, there's a lot with Illinois um, State Board that's still on paper, whereas with uh, Missouri, there's a, you know, most, if not all, is online, and we um, get things done a little more quickly. But um, I would say that um, we have worked with the state of Missouri very, very well, and where our challenges have been is just with the um, – the, uh, with the federal uh, environment, um, their, the federal regulations with Medicare and Medicaid, and of course uh, some of that does touch on what the state requires as well. Um, and you know some of our biggest challenges are with reimbursement and having to change the, um, I guess our workflows as a result, and um, ensuring that we have. Uh, you know, that our documentation is um, where it should be in order to maximize the reimbursement all along with the, what I was uh, alluding to before with the bundled care and value-based um, purchasing and ensuring that we have consumer-friendly uh, care and, and outcomes as well. Um, so we have had to put, um, you know, we're, t- we're hiring the clinical documentation specialists, or we have been, and, you know, they've been in place for several years, but it's still a pretty new role that is uh, continuing to develop and, um, and these uh, documentation specialists ensure that the physicians are following the physicians, ensuring that they're documenting um, as they should in order to maximize the DRG and the bundle, et cetera. And um, so that is uh, something that really has affected our um, our environment. And um, and then, um, you know, we, again, worked with the state of Missouri to ensure that um, things like, um, you know, what we have to, we, as far as from, from a regulatory standpoint, um, the yearly competencies, for example, or what it requires to provide orientation in a hospital. So those have become much more reasonable, and they are reasonable in Illinois as well. So, um, but I would say our biggest challenge is really from the uh, federal environment. Okay, so I'll go. Jason, do you have anything to add? Yes, thanks, Sean. Um, mm-hmm. For those who uh, may not be familiar with the uh, Ameris business model, we're the, the largest uh, operator of uh, micro hospitals. Um, and our business model is to go into um, other states or regions and partner with leading healthcare systems to build um, our micro hospitals. So, what's unique for us is that currently we're operating. Um, in Texas, uh, Nevada, Colorado, um, and have some expansion planned in um, at least four other states that I uh, can't speak to at this moment publicly. Um, So it's a very unique challenge for us um, on a a couple of different levels from the sense that uh, our model being a micro hospital, we are indeed a hospital, which separates us from freestanding emergency departments as well as urgent care. Um, And so we're constantly making sure from an education standpoint, uh, not only to payers or state regulators or federal regulators, that there is a difference um, in our model. Um, There's also the uh, idea of being in a different state. There's different requirements um, for staff. And so uh, part of the kickoff that we have internally is a a detailed review of state regulations and what that's going to impact not only uh, the individual certifications that are required across our clinical roles, uh, but also the clinical roles themselves that are required to be staffed, um, whether it's a dietitian or dietary aide um, in one place versus another, um, the types of nurses that are required, um, ER techs, how do you use those? Um, so there's a consistent um, um, requirement for us to monitor Uh, these types of regulations, the changes in those regulations for us to partner, um, and even, for example, um, with Kathy's statement around the the high level of regulatory activity in California, um, that's been a state that although we'd be excited to go into, um, it's not top of mind uh, knowing that it would be a challenge or a a challenge for entry or cost to entry for us. Um, Tom, I believe you have some additional items to add. 
Yeah, I do. And again, I want to highlight a lot of what's been said uh, specifically at the state level when we're talking about regulations and compliance. And if you look at the reason, and, and at least that was the intention of a lot of these regulations, is to improve the situation for uh, in essence, I'm going to use the term customer because I believe we need to move to a more profit-oriented mentality when we're in healthcare, uh, given the, how should I say this, climate of the industry. And the, the idea is to help that situation. But what my concern is, and, and this is an overall concern, looking outside of society, uh, outside of healthcare into different aspects of society, to see that these regulations and compliance aspects do not backfire uh, into what they were intended. One that comes to mind is the the the, the recent passing. I guess it's not that recent anymore uh, in Seattle uh, for the $15 uh, per hour minimum wage in Seattle. Right. The idea here was we wanted to create a a, a, a more thriving, growing, sustainable. Uh, um, population, if you will, by paying these lower wages a, a higher wage. And now that we've gone and moved forward and see what the ramifications, it, it, basically that new wage law is what they call hail to be a job killer in the city. Right? People couldn't afford it. Or if they did afford it, that went uh, down, that those uh, extra costs went down to the consumer. But what's happened is there's a tremendous amount of unemployment there uh, in Seattle, and they're having to, to catch up. So a well-intentioned, uh, uh, compliant regulation, whatever you want to call it, backfired and literally did what uh, what they were trying to avoid. I'd be interested as we move on in this discussion, do we see some of those things um, in, in, in healthcare in general? Uh, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew and, as we keep this moving along. Thanks, Tom. So the next piece of data that we gathered uh, indicates that 76% of our respondents agreed that hiring talent from the private sector would be beneficial for them. And interestingly, 14% were emphatic in this belief. So we're going to talk today about what are some of the hurdles that practitioners face in recruiting from the private sector, um, what challenges may be posed by regulation, and you know potentially some strategies for getting around those. So first, I would love for you to speak on this, Sean, uh, so I'm going to pass it over mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm th thinking that when you're referring to the private sector, maybe non-healthcare, um, you know, as opposed to, help, you know, having that background in healthcare, whether you're a, um, you know, like a shared services type function, whether it be finance or HR or, um, um, you know, revenue cycle. Um, but it's, uh, um, it, it is very helpful for, um, for us to hire from the private sector, especially in, um, in those sorts of roles, because they can bring so much, uh, such a different perspective that is so valuable to healthcare. Because for, as everyone one knows for so many years we we were in a funnel you know all we thought about was with what was within healthcare but um, really bringing bringing in the whole you know as um, uh, um, as Tom had mentioned earlier, just bringing in the whole manufacturing concept of lean, um, uh, uh, you know, lean practices uh, has really helped us, and I know helped uh, many other um, hospital healthcare systems in order to really lean up and, and, and maximize efficiencies within healthcare. And we have seen great success in hiring from those, uh, from from that group, if that's what we mean by the private sector. Um, but I think our biggest challenge is, is when um, they have to they do have to learn health care. Many do have to learn health care from the beginning. And, and I'm thinking of some scenarios of uh, at one time I was um, over, uh, I was director of HR and at, one, at our large academic medical center. And we hired uh, several business partners who did not come from health care. And it was, very, it, it, it was very, very difficult for them to learn um, the regulatory environment required for nursing and other licensed practitioners um, because it was, um, 
uh, and many times only nurses can understand what it takes, what those regulations are that apply to nurses. And especially in a um, uh, uh, in Missouri, we can hire new graduates um, after they graduate from school before they're licensed, and not every state can do that. And there's a whole other, another set of regulations associated with that. So, um, but anyway, it's um, sometimes it is difficult for them to grasp all the different roles in healthcare and the impact that they make. And I know that Jason was mentioning earlier about, um, you know, uh, you know, certain departments and, and, and the care delivery requires certain levels of licensed staff and, um, and helping them understand that. So it does take a little while for certain groups to really get in tune with, uh, with health care and what those, when, when they have to get into the weeds, that is uh, somebody like a business partner. So, um, so I'll turn it over then to Jason to see if he has anything to add. No, Sean, that was a, a great segue, and, uh, and I'll echo a lot of your sentiments, um, starting mm -hmm. with the idea that, you know, the, the one of the biggest core values of any innovation um, is diversity of thought. And as we've thought, talked mm -hmm. about the constant changes that are required in healthcare, we need innovation. We have to embrace that. Um, and so hiring from the private sector um, is, is a great way to do that, knowing that certain industries have, have moved past healthcare in certain areas uh, because they've had to and they're going through the or they had to go through some of the problems that now healthcare is trying to solve. Um, but the I was thinking of again the talent perspective of it um, beyond just hiring you, you have to lay the, the proper foundation um, to um, embrace people from the private sector. So that starts with uh, almost a cultural shift amongst the, the current teams to um, first off be open to when your your talent pool to extend that talent pool outside of people that do not have health care on their resume um, and that requires some education on the hiring manager level to say what are you really trying to accomplish and what skills are going to translate to what you're trying to accomplish and prepare them for the ramp up that's going to be required um, also that's taking your talent acquisition team when they're doing sourcing to expand their sourcing efforts and be able to understand how what you're reading from a tech resume or a tech LinkedIn profile can apply to the healthcare role. Um, and then when they're engaging with the candidate, be able to talk to them to help them translate and pique that interest of the risk of shifting and in, in, uh, going from one industry to the next. Um, but I, I can say that, you know, we've had some success stories here at Ameris. Um, our, um, previous chief administrative officer came from a technology company and was sought after to try to bring some of that innovative uh, tech-like atmosphere, uh, different engagement strategies into a healthcare company, knowing that we were pushing towards innovation. Um, our current uh, VP of strategy in our biz dev department worked in telecom in choosing based, using analytics and data to figure out where to put cell towers. That translates into when we're going into a new market and a new partner, use those same principles of data collection and, and um, insight gathering to choose where is your best place to drop in a hospital. Um, and then I can speak from personal opinion. Um, towards the end of October or be my third year in healthcare, I came from tech as well. Um, and so the, the translation from what I did from a global marketing perspective and how does that apply to the marketing and uh, requirement and nurturing of candidates in talent acquisition and healthcare. But the, the one warning that I'll put out there um, when those are dipping into this is, first off, your, your candidate has to have a desire to learn um, because, again, as you uh, mentioned, Sean, um, healthcare is definitely different and there's a lot of nuances and requirements from a regulatory perspective that you have to understand. And that candidate needs to be, uh, that new uh, hire needs to dig into that um, and be willing to say, I don't know, and ask. Um, it's three years and I'm still keeping a list of terms and meetings sometimes. And I go back after the meeting and say, what was that? Because uh, people speak in acronyms and things that you're just not used to. You have to be willing to ask. And also, again, laying that foundation for the organization to be patient with those individuals, you know, that they were brought in for a specific skill set that can add value to the company, but they're catching up on the healthcare piece. Um, Tom, any additional thoughts? I do. I, I'd like to get a little more basic around the, the, the survey and the data and so how this all kind of came about and sort of my thoughts. So 
working with WBR, obviously we put this the survey together because we wanted to investigate a few things. And I'm going to go back and echo um, a couple things that were said earlier. I think th there was two points behind trying to, to, to get this information. I think one of them is this trend that we see in healthcare to look a lot more like the private sector. Take a start looking about profitability, start looking about quality of service um, in in a more rigorous way. Now, mind you, what I find very interesting in that particular point was that many of the people that currently came into healthcare really were more from an altruistic or philanthropic perspective, right? They they want to do well. Uh, I spend a lot of time in hospitals, um, no, for research sake, not for health sake, but uh, talking to people and and doctors, and, and and I always ask the motivation question. So why you know why did you get into this quote unquote business, if you will? Um, and you, usually it's the I, I you know I I, I want to help people. I want to make a difference. I want to have the society. But then when you start putting the rigor of business of of wanting to run it more as a profit center, if you will, the, the, it, uh, that, that uh, shine that you first saw as, as, a, as a clinician or, or physician, I think it gets a little tarnished uh, over time. And so I think that's a challenge that we, we as uh, talent leaders need to, to move forward. And it's something that Jason said earlier around this idea of innovation. I, I will point to uh, a seminal book that anybody that is interested in innovation should have on their bookshelf. So the the title is called A Diffusion of Innovation. This is a gentleman by the name of Robert Rogers. I think there's been five editions. It's one of the all-time bestsellers of of this kind of nonfiction genre. It basically talks about two specific ingredients for innovation. Uh, obviously, diversity of thinking that uh, Jason brought up, but also good interpersonal communication. The problem with that is it looks really good on paper, but in sort of in the wild, if you will, meaning <laughs> when you go to organizations and look for that, rarely do those two uh, traits are, are together, right? Because diversity of thinking means you have different people from different walks coming together, and that's something that usually doesn't happen. You know, we as, as humans like to hang out with people that kind of look like us and are similar in thought. And, um, and, and so that diversity is very difficult to, to penetrate that. And yet at the same time, we get that good communication uh, perspective because, yes, we're homogenous in our, our demographics, right? We all kind of hang out together. So it's rare that you see these two traits, like I said, in the wild together. And therefore, as talent leaders in healthcare, if that is what we want to do, meaning we want to innovate the space, uh, what we want to do is we want to intentionally get diverse uh, thought, which would come from diverse people, obviously, and then build on that communication. How do you actually be intentional in, in cultivating that? And I, I can see that uh, this particular question, um, maybe I'm just too close to it, but I, I could see that that kind of validates what, you know, what we're talking about here. So uh, hopefully that gives you, everyone in the audience a perspective of maybe there's an action here somewhere that I can move forward with. Andrew, back to you. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, so moving on to the next piece of information that we gathered from our study, we're actually looking at technology and particularly the satisfaction around learning platforms. So what we saw is that a large chunk, again, 74% of respondents felt that their current learning platforms were performing at or slightly above average. So generally, a fair level of satisfaction around this. What we're looking to discuss now is what is the role of technology in developing a high-performing workforce and a robust talent pipeline? So I would like to start by asking Jason to speak on that. Uh, and then we can see what the other panelists think. Thank you, Andrew. I was actually, um, and as we've talked offline, I was surprised uh, by that particular data point. Um, and ultimately, I guess uh, it might come due to perspective. Um, either the those who are participating um, have not had um, access to other uh, learning platforms, or just my experience in healthcare, I haven't seen what other companies are doing. But one of the things that uh, I wanted to uh, at least bring out um, is that there's so much opportunity 
uh, when it comes to learning, uh, when it comes to, um, you know, skilling up your workforce. Uh, there's so much technology out there um, that helps with uh, succession planning and um, based upon more objective data that's collected through um, analyzing the, the tone and uh, uh, talent reviews um, and performance reviews. Uh, there's uh, some technology out there almost from an AI perspective that they can listen to your, your uh, higher level leadership talk about uh, what's required from a cultural fit perspective or skills fit um, and can pull out tone of voice and then run candidates against that to tell you if they are fit or not. Um, and if they are showing some of the uh, capability um, that they might be the next person up in line for uh, succession planning. Um, then also for the end user uh, from a learning platform, um, when we think about the large majority of healthcare staff, um, they walk around with a cell phone in their pocket, um, and that's their primary way of engaging. They're not always at a desktop. So we're we making sure that things are mobile friendly, not just that the content shows up, but are we able to create an environment uh, for remote and attendees can still collaborate um, in the midst of a class or a session. Um, are we allowing um, our experts uh, within our organization a, an easy way to create content to share their expertise across an environment? Um, and so all these things exist today in one form or another, but is the cost of entry so high that we can't make the investment to do the things that we can? And so in a way, we've become satisfied with what we have, despite the fact of knowing that there's some opportunity. Um, so that's a, probably a random take here uh, with just a surprise of the data itself. Um, Sean, would you like to add anything from your perspective? Yeah, Jason, yeah, you, you said a, a lot of good stuff. I would say amen to what you said. Um, uh, I, I would, you know, add words like, you know, need to be intuitive, fluent, um, just in time, um, the technology, because, again, like Jason said, they, they all have cell phones. Um, you know, our uh, platform currently does not, um, they, they can't access it on their cell phone. Uh, in the future, it it, it's supposed to, um, but that's that's our world today. And um, you know, if we want them to use it just in time, they they already have that phone in their pocket. Um, but I think that they want to, and also with our, um, especially with a lot of the millennials and how they learn. They they actually, and I think with with all the different generations, they need to choose their method of learning. Not everyone learns the same way, and so um, you know, maybe there are they could provide alternatives to um, how a um, uh, some sort of development is offered. Um, and, and also simulation. Simulation is, um, uh, uh, is, is very helpful in our environment because we um, have several sim labs and uh, it's really um, – it's always booked. That's how in demand it is, um, because it, for the physicians as well as nurses and other licensed professionals, um, it really and even our um, you know entry level support nursing staff, you know techs, patient care techs, um, we're using uh, sim labs for them as well in order to uh, upskill them to be ready for that inpatient, that acute uh, rigor of the inpatient environment. So um, I would say that. Um, it's uh, technology. It's advanced, continually advancing, and um, it seems like everyone else is getting, everyone outside of healthcare is um, is getting to that innovation before we are. And why it's even more important, as in our last question, in in inviting that and and looking for folks in that private se private sector um, to promote the uh, innovation piece of this. So, um, so Tom, I'm sure you have more to add to this. I do, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to sort of step out here a little bit. So it's no secret here that I'm the vendor out of the group here in the panel, if if you will, but obviously have a an insight. And I wanted to share uh, with you what sort of sort of behind the scenes view on this particular question, because here's how it usually goes. So let's say you're a a hospital or or some kind of healthcare institution, and heck, probably this goes across multiple industries, and you have decided that you're going to put out an RFP to update your 
learning platform or you're going to purchase some kind of software somewhere. And the, obviously, you need to get funding. And so internally, you, you need to convince leadership that there is a return on investment, the infamous ROI, if you will. And one of the simplest hands down calculation that most people go is down that compliance. Right. So what happens is there's tremendous amount of data that suggests that if somebody is prepared to handle situations that potentially could lead to some kind of litigation and therefore loss and monetary financial uh, art uh, um, pain to the institution, that they can get that money back. So it's a really nice, clean way of generating that internal document. And then what happens is people do that and they go off and they solicit vendors eventually purchase something. What, what happens internally at the same time is there's this perspective that suggests that this particular uh, piece of software or product, whatever it is that you purchased, is a very compliance heavy thing. And so we, we, we run down the compliance path. We make sure that we put all of our compliance training on it or, or whatever else, whatever are the things, pieces of content we need in there. And arguably, let's just say, I think uh, amongst us folks here, that compliance training is not exactly the most exciting thing uh, that you could probably learn. And so that becomes the the introduction, if you will, to the population of a learning platform is compliance content. I would think most, a matter of fact, I, I, I don't have no scientific bearing, but I would suggest probably 90% right, of those people there probably believe that um, that that's their first foray, if you will, into that learning platform. And yet, here we have an opportunity to do all sorts of learning and development, right, which is different, right, than compliance training, the ability to actually develop individuals in skills that they want to be developed in, and therefore the motivation would be significantly higher. So I think there might be a good way uh, to potentially disconnect the implementation or the the face of this new learning platform that you might look you for uh, more towards L&D and maybe a little less towards compliance. Mm -hmm. So anyway, food for thought. Andrew, I'll take throw it back to you. Thanks, Tom. So actually, uh, at this point, we'd like to provide some value for our attendees in the form of key takeaways that you panelists can share. Um, so general general time to talk, recap anything that you feel we missed on this panel, and just introduce you know some strong advice for those listening that they can take back to their offices and potentially implement. So first, I'd like to ask you, Kathy, um, is there anything that you'd like to speak on uh, in terms of a key takeaway that could help people who are listening today? Sure. Thanks, Andrew. So I think one of the key takeaways, and, and, and it sort of has evolved in listening to my co-panelists and, and everything they're saying, um, which I would just put a definite exclamation mark behind everything, um, especially the last two questions. Um, but what I would say is what, what this report tells us, and I, what I hear from my members, really, um, is where healthcare is going, whether you are a clinical person, whether you're leadership, whether you're administration, whether you're coming from private sector into healthcare and have a lot to learn about our language and how we operate in our regulatory environment, the key is the most successful organizations will seek out those that are, that are uh, seek out those individuals that are lifelong learners, whether they are, you know, again, clinical staff or, or other types of staff with, that make a hospital run on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think that the most ex successful organizations will invest in those that they have identified as lifelong learners, whether that's getting your, your ADN to BSN, because that's a goal for many hospitals, especially our magnet hospitals, um, or whether that's, you know, getting your MA, you know, to RN or to another licensed occupation. Um, those hospitals that will invest in that incumbent workforce and that really seek out and identify and reward those lifelong learners are going to be those that have the best performing workforce and likely the best patient outcomes. So I'll leave mm -hmm. it with that, and I will um, kick it to Sean to see what her key takeaways are. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Kathy. That was uh, well well said. And I would add to that. I guess um, what I would see as a key takeaway is, um, I, I mean, I agree with Kathy with the whole lifelong learning. It's one of the, one of our um, 
uh, something we include in our um, uh, behavioral-based um, interviewing guides. And, um, and we do, you know, ask them about, um, you know, situations where, about with the, you know, they can give regarding the lifelong learning. And we make it, what we, what our goal is to make it easy for them. Our, one of our employee value proposition um, uh, key points is that we, um, we value continuous learning and we make it, um, uh, we offer, um, incentives for them to uh, go back to school, um, for example, paying for that BSN, um, you know, paying a differential uh, if they do have their BSN that is a staff nurse, um, but then also um, making it cheaper for them to go on and get advanced degrees um, at our uh, local colleges and universities through cohorts that we actually sponsor um, through our uh, through BJC Healthcare, and it makes it cheaper on their tuition, and they can use their tuition dollars a little bit further. So, um, so really incenting them, and um, but also making it easy and convenient for them. And whether it be through cohorts or a learning management system, or whatever it might be, um, and, and those you're going to find out who your lifelong learners are um, by those who take advantage of those um, continuing um, education opportunities and. and Many of our many of our employees do, um, and then they end up staying as a result. But we always know that um, it's something they can they'll have forever. You know, you don't lose your degree; you have it forever. And um, so that's something that they could always say, "Well, I was able to get it um, through BJC Healthcare through tuition assistance." So, um, so I'll uh, pass it on um, to Jason. Anything to add, Jason? Yes, thanks, John. Um, before I get to my key mm -hmm. takeaway, I did want to comment on something that uh, Tom said earlier with his uh, clarification kind of around the private sector, um, because his timing is perfect in the sense that this is something that we've been addressing um, here within our company. Um, we, we were founded in 2006, so we've been around for only 12 years, so we're a baby in healthcare. Um, yet at the same time, uh, we are... Uh, we have very long tenured people who have been in healthcare for 30, 40 years. And so that feeling of getting into it for the, um, the philanthropic aspect and being a young company that's growing, there is a need for the financial acumen piece. Uh, we've been going after that challenge. Um, and with the communication background, as you're trying to share that, just some advice for the group that's listening um, when, when attempting to have that conversation. Um, our messaging has been around the idea that we go through, um, and that includes everyone in the company, we go through such a huge effort uh, to provide a high-quality, empathetic um, bedside manner or care for our patients. Uh, we do such a, a, a um, you know, put so many things in place, regulatory or just cultural for us to make sure that we're providing the best patient care. And if once you do all that work, um, it's only right to receive a fair market value for that work um, so that we can then invest in our current people and continue to expand to, again, add that type of health care into more and more communities um, as we increase those that we serve. And so it's, a, it's an interesting challenge uh, to Tom's thought. Uh, but to go into the key takeaway, and I'll, I'll be a little quicker uh, with this since I had a, a follow-up comment, um, but I, I, I'm pleasantly pleased to hear Kathy and Sean's comments um, because cause mine is about talent. Um, everything that we've talked about on this webinar uh, goes back to people, and especially in healthcare, at the end of the day, the bedside, uh, the patient satisfaction, uh, the ability to collect revenue, it all, go back, all goes back to the acumen of the person, the desire to be that lifelong, long, uh, lifelong learner. And so, therefore, in an organization, whether you're directly responsible for it, like myself and my team or HR, it, you have to be a talent advocate. Um, you should be talking about talent constantly um, at every level in your organization, building strategies, looking at the problems that are coming at, um, before us and trying to get ahead of them. Um, so if you're a leader in any organization or if you are a frontline individual contributor and talent isn't something that's constantly laying under the, the surface of your conversations, that's an opportunity for all of us to shift. Um, to you, Tom. 
I think it's pretty fair to say that we have confirmed that change is uh, coming is here uh, in this industry. Not only is it here, but it's probably at the rapid rap rapidest. Is that a word? Rapidest, fastest rate of change that we have seen in this industry since this industry was an industry. And we see that innovation is a key to that change. And again, I would suggest that innovation uh, always comes off as being a good thing. But if you cannot adopt that innovation or be able to do it, I don't know if it's if it's useful. And I think it's incumbent on everybody on this call, as well as our listeners, uh, to to manage that. And I think that's plenty right there. I think everyone else here has made great points. Mm -hmm. Andrew? Thanks a lot, Tom. Um, yeah, thank you, Tom. So now we actually have a little bit of time left for some audience Q&A. So I'm going to open up and see what our audience has been sending to us. And here we are. This is the first question. What skills are not needed now but will be needed in the near future? So uh, Jason, I'm going to let you speak on that first, and then you can pass it on if, you, uh, if you'd like. But um, bearing in mind, we have about 10 minutes left of the webinar. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, just kind of similar to the last touchback comment uh, back to Tom's, I think a, um, from a high level business acumen, um, if you're front, uh, front and center at the bedside, you have to understand how what you do ties back to the overall business. Um, that's where healthcare is going when we're working with reimbursement. Um, you know, whether you're coding services, everything needs to be accurate. Um, because that affects our ability to continue running as a business. We are there to serve patients. Uh, that is number one. Uh, but our ability to serve patients means that we have to have business health. So at every level in the organization, business acumen is needed. Excellent. Sean, do you want to take a stab at answering that as well? Yeah, so the, so the question is, um, what skills are not needed? Correct? Not needed today, but will be needed in the near future. Okay. All right. I was thinking the opposite. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, you know, I mean, um, I know it's supposed to, we're supposed to be paperless, but um, I think that there are some, some that are still um, on paper. <laughs> and uh, I think that just, uh, you know, totally your hands are free. Um, you don't have to be carrying things and everything is digital you know, or you can speak to something and give a direction. I think that um, the, the uh, ability to innovate in the, um, in the uh, current environment, that's something that I've been thinking about throughout this, is um, we need to make it easier for caregivers. Someone needs to think of a way to, so those workflows will be much easier because we're still going to have to do um, more with less. And can we get to a point where we can use something like an Alexa to ask to do something in a room, but without disrupting patient care? care and it being friendly to the patient, but, uh, but, but uh, allowing the nurse to do something more easily, more efficiently than um, that they're having to do at times now because they are bombarded from so many directions on the, um, the care they have to provide. So um, I think that the uh, mo more innovation at the bedside um, so that we, you know, we still need that personalized care, but we still have to figure out um, the communication piece for the nurse and how to minimize disruptions um, to the care they're delivering. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you have any perspective to share on what skills may become more desirable as uh, time goes on? Yeah, I, it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm going to jump into the realm of artificial intelligence and, and sort of fast forward to the future, not too far to the future, actually. So it was pretty interesting. I, was, I, was, I witnessed a machine – um, that actually draws blood for you now. So you stick your arm in this machine, needle. it scans where your vein is, sticks the needle in, draws the, the amount of blood, um, and then you take your arm and put a Band-Aid on it and walk away, which is basically what a phlebo phlebotomist does. So one would think somewhere along the line, right, we're not going to need uh, a phlebotomist. We certainly need them now because the machine's expensive and it's still, it's still not scalable and all this other stuff. Yet somebody does that. Now, here's the interesting part. Uh, 
who's going to fix the machine? Who's going to who's going to make sure that that machine is in the right workflow? Who's going to provide the context for this machine to be able to draw blood when it's supposed to to draw? Uh, that 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 job doesn't exist. Um, it will though, right? So we we see that technology makes this impact. There was a great study that came out by uh, uh, Burns by Deloitte in 2017, just last year. And this went, went industry across all industries and basically said that 80% of the people in the survey were worried that artificial will increase unemployment, meaning the phlebotomist out there would say, well, I'm, I'm not going to be needed. Well, no, actually, you're going to be needed in a different capacity. The fact is that technology has created more jobs than anything else in the last 144 years. And so we should welcome technology, not be afraid of it, uh, but be able to be nimble enough to know and recognize when these things come and go. Mm -hmm. Excellent answer. Thanks, Tom. And uh, Kathy, I wanted to ask another question that came in to you with a slight twist. So it was, what compliance regulations are advantageous to you? I'd like to know, um, you know, have you seen any examples where regulations can come in and really improve an environment or facilitate positive change? Wow, you're asking the person whose job it is to <laughs> oppose regulations and statutory requirements <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, so I'm going to get creative. You know, I think about, um, you know, again, I spend my time in workforce and, and workforce policy, and, and by that, I'm, my, it's my job to work with the state legislature and, and sometimes the federal government on um, issues that are barriers to creating the supply and the skills that we need in our health workforce. So I think about one that comes to mind, and this is a federal federal one. Um, I think where we could have some, and I, and I won't necessarily call it compliance, but I will call it a requirement or regulation, is around the types of training that we do um, in terms of how we fund graduate medical education in the, in the nation. Um, you know, there's conflicting reports on whether, you know, we're going to have the huge primary care shortage or have we paid so much attention to primary care that now we're going to have a specialty shortage. So I, I think where compliance and regulation could help us is in how we fund graduate medical education in this country and in the state of California, which has not put any state funding towards GME um, since 2005. Um, so we have all these patchwork ways of how we fund GME in California, which is you know, at least we have some funding, but it's unfortunate because it's patchwork. It's often soft money, and it comes and goes. So I could see compliance or regulation um, that compel state agencies to fund training, whether that's GME, whether that's career technical education at a community college level, or whether that's efficiently funding and paying faculty. We talked about faculty and why folks don't want to teach. It's much more lucrative to, to work in your practice than to teach. So I could see compliance and, and regulations and statutory requirements being helpful in pushing the state to do what is right in ensuring that we have an adequate workforce to take care of our patients now and into the future. Thanks, Kathy. It's a, a great answer to a, a slightly curveball question, so I appreciate that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I would like to ask Shauna, is there, is there any instance where uh, you'd like to comment on this particular topic, uh, the subject of regulation mm -hmm. and the potential for positive influence? Yeah, I would say because uh, we're uh, in two states, because um, we uh, give an example of our um, our patient care techs, which you know technically their title by the state of Missouri is unlicensed assistive personnel, and they do have um, you know within the uh, Nurse Practice Act they have uh, the regulation on what that training should look like, and you know there are you know they have to have um, you know 75 class hours, 100 clinical hours, and so that it's regulated um, in what the content should be, but then. In the state of Illinois, there's nothing. Um, they, and, and what they we have to do is hire in the uh, acute care environment, um, hire CNAs into patient care tech positions. And CNAs, their experience is typically, um, if not all, are in the long-term care environment. So. Um, uh, it is nice that Missouri has that because then we that's what we teach that's what how they develop those programs and um and then uh but unfortunately with illinois um it's it's much different, so it does help us in the state of Missouri. 
And back to you, Andy. Thanks so much for that answer. Uh, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, well, unfortunately, everybody, that's looking like it's all the time that we have for today. But before the webinar is officially over, I want to thank everybody who participated. Um, that includes our live audience. Thank you so much for being with us. And of course, our amazing panelists really shared some great insights today, and I'm super happy that I was able to be a part of this. Uh, just to reiterate, for those who are still listening, if you would like you have access to our great report that this presentation was based on that's in the Content Center, as well as the agenda for our live event and a discount code should you care to attend. Uh, this presentation will soon be available for on-demand viewing as well, so you can recap everything we discussed here. And you'll all receive the information to view the on-demand recording shortly, so please do keep an eye out for that in your email. Uh, thank you for attending once again, and thank you to our great panelists. And on behalf of Cornerstone and WBR Insights and HR Healthcare, I'm wishing you all a wonderful day.